Book of Revelation, chapter 13. And um, I'm going to read a few verses and get down to the one I'll stop at. And verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his uh, ten horns, oh, I'm sorry, upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet was as the feet of the bear, and the, his mouth as the mouth of the lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Verse number three, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him for forty two to continue, I'm sorry, forty and two months. Amen. Uh, as we have uh, communicated and have discussed in the previous uh, sessions, this beast that will rise out of the sea, this is my interpretation based on my study of Scripture, that I firmly believe this beast is none other than what we term as the Antichrist, and not only it is, it, it is the Antichrist, but it's also his government system. Uh, and uh, meaning his kingdom. Okay, so it's kind of a twofold interpretation uh, of, of this particular uh, vision here, or the segment of vision that John saw in this uh, particular chapter. And, uh, and so I would like to discuss that beast a little further and to be able to demonstrate that it's both his kingdom and also the man himself. So based on uh, things that transpire uh, and how this beast is identified here in other passages of scripture, you're able to see Sometimes it's referring to his kingdom, and then other times it's referring to the actual man himself. I believe last time we talked about this, we compared the book of Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel saw a, a beast, a four beast, and uh, he saw the lion, he saw the, the leopard, and, he saw, or, or, the, and the bear or the, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And again, each of these represents, and then he saw a, a fourth beast, beast that was dreadful. And uh, we look at those beasts and we see similarities in this particular uh, beast when we see uh, his, his makeup in chapter 13 and verse number two, where he was likened to the leopard and the feet as a, a bear and the mouth as a lion. And again, this is referring, we know that those uh, the representation of the lion, the leopard, and the bear in the book of Daniel, they were kingdoms. And that fourth beast represented a kingdom. And based on the study of Daniel, we found that uh, those kingdoms were world empires. They were different than other kingdoms uh, of the world and other nations of the world in the sense that they were world renowned, world empires, they control the world. And so the kingdom of Babylon, great influence, great power, uh, but the influence of Babylon did not last forever. Then there was the, the, the Persian Empire, uh, which was the, 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 uh, the second beast, which was the Bear and that Persian Empire lasted a, a great while, but uh, and its influence 
has trickled down some, at least in the east. But the influence of Persia still exists in the Middle East. And you look at then the Grecian Empire, which was the, the leopard. The influence of the Grecian world still affects this world today. As a matter of fact, a lot of our English terminology can be based on a lot of Greek words. And so it influenced the whole world. And then you had the Roman Empire, this other beast, the last beast in Daniel chapter 7. And the Roman Empire, the Latin Empire, still has a great influence in this world today. Uh, over in uh, Rome right now, a major influence. And the Bible talked about those kingdoms losing their uh, domain or power over the world, but yet they would still exist. And then here you see Daniel, I'm sorry, uh, John the Revelator speak of this, uh, this beast in the last day that had their remnants of those other world empires. And so when you see it from this perspective, as we saw in Daniel chapter 7, this is referring to the kingdom of uh, the Antichrist. And as he goes on, he said, and I saw one of his heads as if it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And with this passage of scripture, uh, several things stands out uh, that stand out to me is the first thing is, and this is what I'm going to start teaching from my notes. We're going to deal with the beast in the wound. And he said, I saw one of his heads as, as uh, it was a mortal wound, so to speak. Now, this is a, a head shot, a head wound, uh, a mortal wound. It, it, it's not superficial. Now, the issue here, again, if it's, if it's referring to a man here, uh, and you say that some people interpret that, well, their hand to Christ is going to be wounded and almost dead. Well, if it was the Antichrist, why is he referring to one of his heads? Furthermore, uh, we in, in uh, chapter 17, it actually tells what the heads of this kingdom is. In chapter 17. So, But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this, and I'm going to do some reading. Since the, the wound is located on one of the heads, it apparently is not a literal or physical wound uh, because it, it was a deadly wound. Now, some people think that the Antichrist is going to die, and they're going to rise him back up, raise, you know, raise him up. The uh, devil is going to raise him up, and then he's going to fill him and control the world. Uh, but... The problem with that is that it's seven heads. And it said one of the heads. So if it was a person, that means there's going to be seven other people. Now, uh, the horns represented kingdoms within or nations within that world-dominating empire. The heads didn't represent that. So, the, no, I'm, yeah, the heads. The heads actually, when you look in chapter 17, kind of getting ahead of myself, it talked about seven mountains, but also seven kings or seven kingdoms, and we'll get into that later. So, uh, again, I believe, again, this is referring to uh, the kingdom itself. And uh, the, the interesting thing about this is that um, some people believe that this beast, his deadly wound being 
uh, his deadly wound being healed is the resurrection of the uh, Roman Empire or the revival of the Roman Empire itself. Again, I'm just giving you some, some things that people say it is. We'll get to exactly what I believe just used in Scripture. And the thing that we do know that the recovery of the beast causes his fame around the world. Once his deadly wound was healed right there, colon, and then all the world wandered after the beast. When either if it's the Roman Empire being raised again to life, new life, then the world will wander after that. If it's one of the kingdoms of the Roman Empire that's a part of this last world confederacy that, that uh, pretty much is destroyed and then comes to life again uh, and helps to make this world power, a world power, people will wonder at it as well. But again, back to what I was saying now, it's getting ready to shift to people not only worshiping that kingdom, but worshiping the man that's behind the kingdom, the Antichrist himself. And they wandered after the beast. Now, verse, the next verse, please. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and then they worshiped the beast. First, they wandered after the beast. And I believe, again, that it was initially referring to the kingdom as the previous verses. And now they are going to shift to the man who is the power of it because they begin to worship him. And how do I know they begin to worship the beast as a man? Because we're going to find out that in the next couple of uh, passages of scripture. So... They worship the dragon that gave power to the beast. And again, I don't know whether this is direct uh, Satan worship. Most people who are worship Satan today, they don't really know they are under his influence. They think they are participating in other religions, not realizing they are worshiping the devil. Uh, so, uh, next verse. And there was given unto him a, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So here we are. He was given a mouth speaking great things. This can't be talking about a person, I mean a, a nation or kingdom. Now it's talking about again the man that is controlling this kingdom, the Antichrist. And power was given to him to continue for 42 months, and we know that's three and a half years. Um, going to skip down with some of this. Some of it uh, you can read for yourself, those who I will give this to. This person speaking blasphemies and stuff like that, you can read about that in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, uh, verse number 8, verse number 20 and 25, and then you can also see it in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, and it's referring to the man called the Antichrist. I don't have time to really get into detail, and uh, I'm, I'm going to skip through all that. But this beast continues for uh, three and a half years, which we see that in other passages of Scripture. And then the Bible says that the beast blasphemes those that are in heaven. Uh, go ahead and read the next verse, verse 6. And he opened his mouth and, uh, and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. Now, anybody know the name? Uh, I, I'm just wondering whether you know it. <laughs> Blaspheme his name, 
his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Now, quite interesting <laughs> uh, that some people believe that this passage of scripture in verse number six, where it says it blasphemes them that are in heaven, that it's referring to angels. I personally believe when it said that it's going to blaspheme, that he is going to blaspheme people in, in heaven, it's, this is referring to those that dwell in heaven, speaking of the church now is in heaven. One of the reasons is this. Throughout the whole book of Revelation, every time an angel manifests himself, you hear it mentions that it's an angel. There are too many passages of scripture that mentions the angel, what he looked like, how, you know, the power that he had, what he came to do. Throughout the whole book of Revelation, it mentions angels. It talked about how all the angels around the throne and all that. Why would the book of Revelation, throughout the whole book of Revelation, talk about angels, but in this passage of scripture, just say they did dwell in heaven? God is never mystique, mysterious, and everything else when he speaks of uh, the angels are in heaven. He's quite frankly wide open, tells it like it is. That the only time there's a mystery that comes in is when there's a, it, it's surrounding the church. It seems like God wants people to think what they want to think. And, it, you know, it's like, because the Bible talks about the church in the Old Testament it talks about it being a mystery, actually. In the New Testament, it talks about the church was a mystery in the Old Testament. And you hear all about the church in the, uh, throughout the epistles. And then the first couple of chapters of the book of Revelation, you hear about the church. And then it gets silent again. Then you don't hear anything, anything about the church. You just start hearing about saints. Now, why in the world... Does God change his terminology? I can't get a person that, that this post-trib or mid-trib to answer that yet. That God just, why does he just change his terminology? Why does he stop talking about the church? You know why he stopped talking about the church? Huh? And when it's in heaven, it's not the church. There's no mention of church in heaven because it's not in church. It's not called the church in heaven. We're the church on earth, not the church in heaven. And you see saints on the earth. I, yeah, I, let's do this little quick study. Pastor going to talk to him. <laughs> Y'all don't know that's the inside joke. That's on the outside. <laughs> Verse number seven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. And to overcome them. And power was given him over all. Everybody say all. all. All kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, if this is true and the church is on earth, that means Satan now has the power over you. Because who gave the uh, Antichrist the power? Who gave the beast the power? Huh? I can't hear y'all with your mask. Come on, enunciate. Who gave the Antichrist the beast of power? Oh, Satan, right? The dragon. We just read it. And the dragon, oh, I'll read it for you. <coughs> that's not corona. That's just clearing my throat. I don't think it's corona anyway. I'm clearing my throat. I pray it's not going on anyway. You praying back there? 
Verse 4, and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. So the beast has its power from Satan, right? Y'all agree with that? That's it, one plus one. Now, Satan gives the Antichrist, or the beast, the power. The beast now makes war. Next verse. And he, it was given to him to make war. You were good on verse 6. Don't back, don't uh, fall back. <laughs> huh? Yeah, don't lose your way. And he, he uh, verse 7, where we were, thank you. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So this is saying that God has given Satan and the Antichrist power over saints. I don't see anywhere in the Bible where God gives Satan power over the church. He's given it over the saints, but he's never given power over the saint, over the church to the Antichrist. I mean, to the to the devil. Never. Actually, to the contrary. He gave the church all the power over the enemy. So God now is going to change His mind and His method. And his, nope, you had the power, but I got to take it from you, church, right now. I just don't understand how people see stuff that's not in the scripture. Yeah, Indian giver. <laughs> For years, I thought the Indian giver was the Indian that was giving and whatever, but it wasn't the Indian. It was somebody would give to the Indian and they would take it back. Yeah, you can have this. Oops. So that's what, that, that's what God is going to do to church. You got the power. Oops. I got to teach you, so I got, I, got, I, got, I got to purify you, so I got to say, no. And the scripture tells us in 1 John that great is he that's in us than he is in the world. And do you know what, who was in the world? That the Bible was talking about? Huh? I didn't hear you. Y'all talking, talking to, you know, take your mask off. You're going to say something? No, don't do that. Here we go. So y'all have me to, to go back because y'all not answering my questions. They're like, huh? So I'll just find it here now. See? I got more ways to, to, to uh, do this thing. All right. I can answer it, but I want to show you in the Bible since y'all didn't answer me. Oh, come on. All right. First John chapter 4. I don't know why I couldn't. Oh, I was in second John. That's why. Chapter 4. Verse number 3. And every spirit that confesseth not Jesus Christ is come, is the, and the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of what? The spirit of who? And whereof ye know, ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is what? It's in the world. When they're talking about greatest he that's in me than, than he's in the world, we said that we're talking about the devil. He's talking about the spirit of the Antichrist. He just said that. Look at it. He talked about the spirit of the Antichrist. And he said, 
Uh, Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. The spirit of Antichrist should come. And even now already is in the world. Then he goes to the next verse. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Overcome who? The spirit of the Antichrist. Uh, because great is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He that's in the world. And we have the spirit to overcome. Because the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. Hello? So, if the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world, the spirit of iniquity is already in the world, and we know the spirit of iniquity is the spirit of Antichrist. Yes. And the Bible says iniquity shall wax cold or grow, grow worse. Yes. The love of many shall wax, wax cold because iniquity shall abound. It shall grow worse, so worse. And so this spirit of iniquity, the spirit of lawlessness, the spirit of the Antichrist, what's going on in the world is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, we have power over the spirit of Antichrist. The church does. And in, oh, see, make me do this. Somebody say something. All I need is somebody to tell me to talk to y'all. I'm going to talk to y'all. That's all I need. Did somebody tell me to talk to y'all? There we go. All right. That's what I needed. I'm going to talk. Okay. Second Thessalonians 2. Saying the same thing, verse number 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work the mystery of iniquity doth already work only he who now restrains. You have another version translation so we can say it means will restrain. The word let if is old King James meaning restrain. He who now restrains, you got another version, until he be taken out of the way. There's something restraining. Do you have another translation? W-E-B. <laughs> and plus, that's the wrong uh, verse. We're in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. Let's see what that he, he says in 2.7. There we go. Bango. That's a good verse. Good version. But I'm saying, you went to verse 2. I was like, what is that? And he was talking about what I was talking about. For the mystery of lawlessness... And we know that's the spirit of Antichrist. Already works. Only there is one who, re na who restrains now until he is taken out of the way. And that one is not you. Yeah, I'm the one. No, it's not you by yourself. That's the Holy Ghost in you. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And so the holy, then you go back to where we were, then the, 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 the lawless one, he can't come because there's somebody greater in the world that's holding him back. He has no power to come. He wish he can come and pop out and show. He can't do it as long as the church is here with the Holy Ghost. But the same, oh, here we go. Why do people think the Holy Ghost can come down and not go back up? I don't know. Well, no, 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 the church is going to be, no, the Holy Ghost that came down, when it came down, it came to fill believers. And when it goes back up, it's taking everybody that has it. So if you got the Holy Ghost in you, guess what? You can't help but go up.
because the Holy Ghost is going up. And if you want to go up, you got to make sure you get the Holy Ghost in you. That's the only restraining power. That's the only thing greater than the spirit of the Antichrist, the spirit of lawlessness. Once he taken out of the way, verse number eight, then the lawless one, we know that's the Antichrist, will be revealed. The Antichrist cannot be revealed until the, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know how somebody can. He can't be revealed until the, the, the Holy Ghost is in us, is gone. Yes. Yes. Can't come. That's why I don't plan on seeing, some people trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. I'm not trying to figure out who he is. <laughs> If you, I, you know, when I'll find out who he is, when I'm looking down, say, oh, it was that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We'll be back to get you in about seven years, me and Jesus. Yeah. When we get you, we're going to put you in the pit. No, he's going right to uh, Lake of Fire. Now, you're doing a great job back there, and I'm not being facetious. You're really a, a great job. Now you go back to Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. I think we left off there. Excellent. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. So, so who, is, who is he talking about? If the Antichrist can't be revealed, why the restraining power to hold? Now, hold it. it. So, so a person who believes that the church is still going to be here, that must mean that God's going to take the Holy Ghost out of you. while the church is still here. If, the Holy, if, if, the, if God takes the Holy Ghost out of you, guess what? Out of us, we no longer the church. <laughs> we just write other human beings. You ain't taking the Holy Ghost out of anybody. Unfortunately, I do think some people, well, I ain't gonna touch that. <laughs> And it was given unto him <laughs> to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So they're going to be saints. Some people believe that there's not going to be anybody saved during the tribulation period. Let me tell you something about God. His arm is not too short that he can't save in any period. In the worst, oh, sh in the worst conditions of mankind, God always was able to save someone. Oh, yes, sir. I mean, the earth was filled with violence. Corruption was all over the earth. God was so sorry that he, he created man. This is how God felt. He said, I, I'm, I feel so sorry I created man. I'm going to take everything out. Not just man, but because of man's sin, he killed innocent beasts. He killed every bird and, and fowl and everything else except for two. Say, so I'm going to save them two by two and seven of the clean things. He said, I'm going to destroy it all because of man's sin. Man had become so darkened and so alienated from God that he said I'm going to wipe out everybody and in the midst of that great judgment God was able to find eight people that he can save <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah was so despicable Jesus. detestable abominable and everything else you can think about and God said, I need to come down and to destroy it. But in the midst of that lewdness, in the midst of that uh, debauchery, in the midst of that uh, horrible, despicable stuff that was going on inside of those cities, uh, God said, I am going to still save somebody in the midst of it. And even if I had to drag them out of Sodom, I'm going to save them. Don't you know the angels came in and actually had to drag Lot out because of the mercy of God, because of the goodness of God? It doesn't matter how bad things are. 
matter how dark things are, God said he can save somebody. My arm is not too short. Yes. Nobody's going to be saved in the, in, because people are going to say it has to be the church. No. Oh. Because 144,000 we know saved in the tribulation period. That's not the church. But these saints, these saints, now I got a little preaching. But uh, I'm, I'm going to do a little quick study uh, here, and I, I probably wind up having to stop with this. It, it, it's really clear in Old Testament, I don't say Old Testament, in Scripture, uh, in the New Testament Scripture, I'm sorry, that God has never already said this and will never give uh, Satan authority over the church. He will never give Satan authority. Let me tell you how, how that sounds. Come, come here, Sister Simpson. Just, just act, let me get somebody who knows that I'm just only, this is just an enactment type of thing. Come in, Zach. That's my, my little nephew there, my big nephew, tall nephew there. Or he got bigger than me, taller than I am. So, just act like I don't like you. I like you. So you get that right. And I just can't stand you. You're my enemy. Everything I do, you try to foil. Everything I try to, to, to bless somebody with, you try to take. You're just totally against me. You're always talking about me. You accuse me before everybody else. You turn my words and twist my words. You are the enemy. You are the accuser. You, you know, you rebelled against me. You took some of my angels with you, lied to them, deceived them. People I'm trying to save, you're trying to work in their lives and everything else. You're doing everything, distorting my truth. You're just, you're opposite, totally against me. And this is my bride. I love her this much, I'm going to give you control and power over her. Overcome her. She needs to learn a lesson. She needs to be purified. Go ahead. That's what that, that, that's what that is saying. Now, me being a man, no, I wouldn't do that to my wife. What kind of God do we serve that would do that to his bride? That's sick. Thank you. That's sick. That's just sick. I'm just sorry. I'm just, my God is, that's not my God. I don't know. That's just not my God. Now, does God try his children? And yes, was that persecuting? That wasn't God persecuting the church. It wasn't God persecuting the church. It was religious people always per From the very beginning, in the Old Testament, it was always religious people, false religion, false, uh, uh, you know, uh, false prophets. Anyway, God always has saints. He always has saints. The adversary only has the right on individual saints, not over the whole church. So let's find out who these saints are. So the adversary will be given authority during the tribulation period, and this is, this is a seven-year period. I heard something new for the first time. I've heard, I've heard all sorts of things. I'm just sharing with you because I just heard, I, I've never heard this before. Even people who I've heard that's post-trib and some people who mid-trib believe the tribulation period is seven years. But I've heard something new that there's the tribulation period, and then after the tribulation period, it's the wrath of God, and after the wrath of God, it's the wrath of the devil. 
Yeah, that's what I've heard. And so the church is going through the tribulation. They're going through the part that God's going to tribulation and everything else, but they're not going through the wrath part. So I said, well, how long is the tribulation? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Seriously, that's the answer I got. I don't know. But the rest of it, I said, no, no. So it's the whole tribulation period, in my understanding, is seven years. And that's the wrath of God. And God uses, in his wrath, he allows Satan to unleash his wrath. Okay, now, the word saints is a very peculiar word in the Bible because, again, it's referring to saints here. You still have that, Pat? Yep, saints. And it's during the tribulation period. Well, well let me phrase it this way. The seven-year period. All right? You want to call it whatever you want to. Now, I have here a study that I, actually my study, of the classification of saints. I've asked people that believe that, believe that uh, the church is going to be in a, a number of people, several people that believe in it. The, the post trib and stuff like that, and they have to say this is a, they have to say this is the church. They have to say it because it's church is here and these are saints. So I said, so you? I said these are saints. He said, no, the saints are the church. I said, so you're telling me God has never had people He calls saints or elect? Never had any elect? Whenever it's talking about elect, it's always the church. So, I did a study to see uh, the dispensations or time periods of saints on the earth. And I found seven. And, and I'll tell you, you know, so I'm going to do it this way. So, you had the pre-fall saints. Now, there, there's seven categories, and actually the eighth is the new beginning. I'll show you that. But this is my study. So you had the pre-fall saints. What are the pre-fall? Meaning before the fall of man. Adam and Eve were saints. The word saint, when you look at it, is talking about a holy one. Somebody that's right with God. All right? And so before the fall, you had the, uh, the first classification of saints. Now we watch the numbers. Because numbers in the Bible mean something. Now watch this. So the first classification is the pre-fall, saints before the fall. It was those that who were in innocence, Adam and Eve. They were saints in the garden. They were, they was, they were in innocence. I think I said that right. All right. So the word, the number one means what? It's the Hebrew word that means beginning. It's the beginning of the number uh, line. It's, it means pure. It's the uh, Hebrew word for pure and actually God-likeness. And so the first dispensation, I'm just trying to put up, oh, come on. The first dispensation uh, of saints was those who were in innocence. Those who appear. One means beginning. God likeness and purity. The second group or classification of saints were the pre-law saints. These were the saints that existed before the law and before actually uh, uh, before Moses, obviously. But these were the patriarchs. So you had people who began this uh, journey with walking with God. This is the second classification. The number two, second classification, number two means separation. It's always talking about separating. It, it, it also means union, which is kind of odd. Two means union and uh, separation. Get this. How is it that way? 
because it, it, it's during this time uh, where God was separating the patriarchs to himself. He called out Enoch to walk with God. And during this time, the saints were called to be separated. But it also means union as well. Two, where two could get together. And so it's also union, people being united to God, separated from the world and everything else and united with God. And this is what you see with uh, the patriarchs uh, when they walk with God. When you look at Noah, when you look at Enoch, when you look at Abraham and all the patriarchs, when you look at uh, Joseph, Jacob, all right? Now, I don't call them Old Testament saints. Why? Because they was before the Old Testament. So y'all like, huh? They're in the books of the Old Testament. But the law didn't begin, the law didn't begin in Genesis. You don't see the, <laughs> Genesis is really not an Old Testament book. It's the book of beginnings and the book of patriarchs. The book of Exodus begins the law. Just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not New Testament books. So, the, here we go. You have the, the, the third classification. Number three are the Old Testament saints. It's, oh, I'm sorry, Old Testament saints, right, which is Israel. Israel was, was the Old Testament saints. All right, now watch this. The Number three, this is the third division. Number three means divine wholeness or divine witness. That's what the word number three, the letter, the, uh, the number. I said the word, the letter. The number three means divine wholeness and divine witness. God used Israel, the Old Testament saints, the, new, the law, as his divine witness. And the whole, uh, uh, the, the tabernacle and the, the ark and the commandments, they were set to be a divine witness before God. And so the Old Testament, again, this is the, uh, the third classification or category of saints. It's the Old Testament saints. The Old Testament saints were not the same as the uh, pre-law saints. What do I mean? Abraham and Isaac wasn't saved under the law. Abraham did those things before the law was even given. Hello? They were pre-law saints. They were patriarchs. And, and uh, uh, the patriarchs weren't saved the same way that Adam and Eve was in the beginning. So then you have, again, the third uh, group is, again, the Old Testament saints, which were saved in a different dispensation. And it, again, it represents divine wholeness. God was doing something divine, making this nation complete in him. He separated them out and made them complete, and they were his witness on the earth. That's what number three means. The fourth classification of saints. Each classification is like a dispensation. The fourth classification of saints are called, what I call, for lack of better terms, the first interim period saints. Now, what is that? Again, that's the number four. Watch that, the fourth classification. This is the fourth period where you have sainthood that's different than the other periods. Now, the, the first interim period is different than the, the period of the law under Moses. And this is the period where John the Baptist began to prepare the way of the Lord and when Jesus walked the face of the earth in his earthly ministry. It was an interim period. And that's why the thief on the cross, guess what? I doubt very seriously on that cross that he obeyed the commandments. And he gave a lamb for his sin. 
As a matter of fact, the lamb was right next to him. And the lamb that was next to him was, the, was, the, uh, was going to take away his sin. And so during that interim period, John the Baptist would say, hey, there's a lamb coming. The lamb of God was taken away the sins of the world. He said, hey, I baptized the baptism of repentance. Hey, he commanded the people to repent, and he told the people to be baptized. These people had faith, and they were saved under a different dispensation, and they were saints. They weren't Old Testament saints. They were interim saints. And that's a different classification. This is the fourth classification of saints. You can't describe the Old Testament saints to the, to the man on the cross and those people that believed uh, during John the Baptist days and during Jesus' walk on, on the earth that, you know, what Jesus was teaching and all that. They wanted to stone Jesus for what he taught. They wanted to get rid of the, uh, the Jesus believers for what they were believing in. Why? Because he was teaching something that was against their traditions and their doctrine. But they were saints. They were saints. They were saved under a different way. Those were saved under uh, uh, this particular ministry. This is, again, this, the, the fourth period of saints. Now, this fourth period of saints... The, word, the number four is divine creativity on earth. The number four means divine ability and divine creativity on earth. In other words, God, <laughs> he came, when Jesus said to that man on the cross, and he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. That man who, was take, who had palsy, and he said, thy sins are forgiven you. You see, Jesus was telling that guy right there that you're a saint. Your sins are being forgiven you. It was divine. The number four is divine activity on earth and divine creativity on earth. The divine creator was now on earth. That's what the number four means. And that, that is what the fourth dispensation or the fourth period, not dispensation, the fourth period or the classification of saints, which was completely different. A person could be saved during Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry, following what John the Baptist and Jesus preached. And they did not have to obey and, and, and you know, had to kill animals and stuff like that. Now, next verse. Next, next verse. The next group. That's group number five. Again, I'm talking about the five, the, the, the classification of saints. So I, again, I was trying to trying to see in Scripture how people are called saints that are not the same. Because if this is the church, this word saints, if that's the church. That means we're going to be here, right? If that's the church, that means we're going to be. But if you can see other people that are called saints that doesn't fit the classification of, of the church. So I wanted to see every classification. Now, for some of you, this might be putting you to sleep. But anyway, some of you, you're interested, and that's fine. I can't interest everyone. So anyway, uh, the fifth group, who's the next group? The next dispensation, huh? The church. We're the saints right now, currently. We're the fifth group. And you know what number five means? Grace. We're the fifth group, or the fifth classification of saints. And we, and the number five means grace. It's the church age, the church, the, the age of grace. That's the fifth classification, the fifth period. Guess what the sixth period is? It's the second interim, the second interim. It's the tribulation period. Now, I say it's the interim period, you're going to see the interim. It's interim means it's between two different dispensations or two time periods. Now, again, number six, the sixth classification are the tribulation saints. Why? The word uh, the number six means imperfection and incomplete. It means the number of man, six. 
And that's why 666 is going to be the number that the Antichrist uses because it says, the Bible says, it's the number of man. It's man falls short. And so the fifth group is the church, and the sixth group is the, the number six group, which means imperfection, that incomplete. Now, they're not the church. The people of grace, and then they're, they're not the group in number seven, which we're going to get to, but the number six. And I notice each of these time periods or classifications and then the number coincides with that. And I looked at the number and I was like, wow, this is... And then the seventh group or the seventh period of saints. Now, you can prove it. I'm not just making this up. You know every group we just named is in Bible. This is the group right there, the sixth group of saints. That's different than the Adam and Eve in innocence, the patriarchs, the people that were under the law, the people that were saved under John the Baptist and Jesus' ministry, the church, and now this group. And then the seventh group of saints is the millennial period of saints. Believers during the millennial period. Because when you read Revelation chapter uh, 21 or chapter 20, you find that at the end of chapter 20, the, de the, de the devil is released after the millennium. And guess what? The Bible says he goes to the camp of the saints. What saints? Saints during the tribulation period. Because during the tribulation, there are going to be people that decide to live for God during that period. That there will be human beings, mortals, not people with uh, glorified bodies. You can see that in, in Isaiah. We're going to cover that in another chapter in, in, in the book of Revelation. But there will be mortals in the, uh, the millennial period. So there will be millennial saints. Again, that's the seventh classification or seventh group. What does the number seven mean? Rest and completion. That's when God gives mankind rest for a thousand years where he will rule on the earth. It means rest and completion. Seven. So I said there's seven groups and possibly eight. The eighth group, the word, the number eight means what? New beginning. So it is the new heavens, the new earth, the new era, and a new classification. And, I, and, and this is people that live in an eternity. And so, and you see in God's, God's word and the way things are designed, it's just only God can do that. But back to the statement, these saints... This is why I don't believe it's the church, number one, because if it was the church, why not just call them the church? Like you did in all the other chapters, and then also in the rest of the New Testament. And again, to verify that it's not the church, again, this study was to see if, in fact, we can find in the Bible groups of people and classifications of people that are called saints who are not the church. And yes, you can see throughout scripture different classifications of people that are called saints. In the book of Revelation, you have two classifications right there. You have the millennial saints and you have the tribulation saints. They're not the same group. Because the, 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 the tribulation saints, you find that they are actually going to live a thousand years on the earth with Christ. And uh, they, because they're going to be given mortal bodies. So, I mean, immortal, Im, immortal, bo immortal bodies. I get that right. So when we are given immortal bodies, when we reign with, with him, we're not saints then. Saints always refer... Now, unless you Roman Catholic, saints always refer to people on earth. 
And Roman Catholic, the saints are in heaven. But nowhere in the Bible do you see saints in heaven. He talked about them that dwell in heaven. He called them 24 elders. And he talked about the bride. He never called them saints in heaven. That terminology, saints, is never mentioned in heaven. It's mentioned on earth. Now, it does say this. I will say it says this. When it mentions the saints coming back with him. He's coming back with thousands of his saints. And I believe in that particular terminology is talking about redeemed man. This saints that obviously we're saints now. When we go, we get in the rapture, we come back down. Amen. We are holy. We will be completely changed. But again, in, in reference to that particular terminology, here it's talking about people on earth. Not people in heaven. And these are people that the Antichrist will have power over. Now, and uh, power was given to him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. And uh, quite frankly, all of them that dwell on the earth. Let's uh, verse number 8. And all, everybody say all. All. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written uh, from the foundation of the world in the book of the, land, of the life of the Lamb who has been killed. I was going to say something sounds weird. It's because you're in the... Uh, there we go. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written. So this is not saying everybody saying those who are not... names who are not written in the book of the, of the life of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world because there will be people who won't worship him. Um, next verse. Please. If any man, if the church was on earth, he would have said, he that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. How do I know? Because in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, he said it seven times. I believe it was seven times, right? Seven times, brother you? Seven times, right? Seven or eight. Uh, I know it was seven. It could have been eight. But he that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. But here, he didn't say that. He said, he that have an ear, let him hear. Let him hear. Not what the Spirit is saying. There's no mention of the Spirit talking to people on earth. Not during this time. Next verse. He gives this warning. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword, must be killed with the sword. Here we go again with this word. Here is the patience or the endurance and the faith of the saints. When you read this passage of scripture, and this is what I'm closing on, next week we'll pick up with the, the other beast that comes up out of the land. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. There's no way when I read this that I can see that this refers to the church in any way, shape, or form. The faith that God desires for us to have and the, the endurance that God desires for us to have is always completely different. Faith and endurance for the church. Again, for the tribulation saints, this is what their faith is going to be about. We, we've been walking with God, walking with God, living in God, and exhibiting 
endurance or faith, I mean endurance meaning patience, through our walk right now. The Bible in all of the epistles we read talks to us about endurance. The need for us to have endurance and the need for us to have faith. And that faith is always predicated on God. He that cometh to God must believe he is and the reward of them that diligently seek him. And having faith what God is designed to do. Their faith, look at that, is completely different. When you look at the, old, the faith of the Old Testament saints, obviously they had to believe in God, but their faith was completely different. What Noah had to believe for was completely different. I don't have to believe for some ark and boat. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? In every dispensation of saints, it was different. And when you look at this classification of saints, you don't see anything resembling the patience and faith that the church supposed to exhibit. So you could stand, please. Again, I know I've, I'm communicating things that you already know. You already know. But I'm just trying to use some scriptural uh, points and references. Uh, so you won't be shaken. Let me say this. Do I believe the church is going to go through stuff? The church has been going through stuff since its inception. And we're going to go through stuff until we get out of here. Do I believe we're going to have tribulation? The church has been going through tribulation since its inception. We're going to go through tribulation until we get out of here. Are we going to go through persecution? The church has been going through persecution since its inception. Are we going to have, of course. Does the devil, do we suffer the devil's attack and all that? Of course. But the stuff that the Bible mentions in the book of Revelation is not the same as what we go through now. I was, wasn't about to say something, but I think I am. I don't believe that a person who receives the Holy Ghost is going to be left on this planet with the Holy Ghost. That means there's going to be people with the Holy Ghost on the planet. There are scripture that says in the Bible and some parables that some of his servants he's going to cast into outer darkness and there's going to be weeping and wailing gnashing at the teeth what am I saying you're not staying here with the Holy Ghost and you're not going to heaven with the Holy Ghost if you're not saved you're not saved if you got the Holy Ghost. Do you know how many scriptures are talking about a person who saved can be lost? Do you, do you know there are scriptures for that, right? Do you know there are scriptures where people prophesy in his name, cast out devils in his name, and done many wonderful works? You can't do those things if you don't have the Holy Ghost. You can try. I'll give you an example. A man has the Holy Ghost. But he gives himself over to sin. Laying around with women. Doing drugs. Abusing himself. 
doing unpartnered, uh, I ain't gonna say unpartnered, anything is important. Uh, doing stuff that's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 9. You can put it up there. See, you can do some of this stuff and have the Holy Ghost. So, do you think because you have the Holy Ghost and you do this, you're going to be saved? The Holy Ghost is not a license to sin. It's a license to be righteous. You have the right, the authority, and the power to be righteous. It's not a license to sin. So what's going to happen to those people that has the Holy Ghost inside, but they don't yield to the Holy Ghost? They don't obey the Holy Ghost. They quench the Holy Ghost. They put the fire out of the Holy Ghost. What's going to happen to those people? Are they going to heaven? I can show you Bible where Jesus said that there are people who he's going to have that, that was part of the kingdom, children of the kingdom. Children of the kingdom, he said. That are not going to be saved. You're not going to stay here and get a second chance. Well, I'll get a second chance. The adversary, and I'll get a second chance, and, and I'll just have my head be hit. No, because you had the Holy Ghost in you, and the Holy Ghost is not staying. Well, I want the Holy Ghost out of me. Really? Do you? That's the thing that can save you. What you want out of you is the unholy ghost. That's some unholy stuff that you want out of you. Oh, I can tell when I'm talking to I can tell when I'm talking to you now. I'm talking to him. Y'all might think I'm teaching something. I know the bishop believes this. He, he said it many times. I believe, so sometimes the bishop said that, yeah, people look like, I say, oh, I believe that. I got scripture for it. He said the kingdom of heaven like a, a net. He's going to take the good and take the bad. He said the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom. It's not talking about people in the world. That's not the kingdom of heaven. He said the kingdom of heaven. He said he's going to gather everybody in the world. He said, I'm going to gather them from my, out of my kingdom. That's what that's. He said, I'm going to gather everything out of my kingdom. Everything that's out, out of my kingdom, I'm going to gather. And I'm going to put some here to cast them, some there. Then that may make, make some of you afraid. And then some of you get under the impression that I if I mess up, I'm going to hell. No. Righteous man fall. But guess what? Man, I ain't going down there because it's hard getting up. Spiritually speaking, I'll get back up. It's easy to get up in the spirit than to get up once you start getting old. <laughs> Let me tell you that. Y'all young bucks, y'all know what I'm talking about. The unrighteous don't get up. What makes you righteous or unrighteous? See, unrighteous, they keep on living that way and justify it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The righteous let you know I ain't that old. And I got up quicker than I got down. Oh, I ain't doing it again. <laughs> Once is enough, y'all saw it. The righteous get down, fall down, get tripped up. Get back up again. Oh, you're not going to keep me down. I, I, I can't stay down. See, I'm going up one day. Don't catch me down, God. I, I'm, I'm getting in position. I'm not parsing myself. I'm getting in position. So one day he's going to call me home. 
You see, greater is he that is in me than the spirit of iniquity that's in the world, the spirit of lawlessness that's in the world. And inside of me is that restraining power that's keeping him in check. But one day, there's going to be a trumpet that's going to sound. And there's going to be a voice that says, come here! And I'm not going to be like some of those Christians. Who, me? No, I'm not going to be who, me? Or how about this? I'm not ready yet. Don't come yet, Jesus. Not ready. I'm not ready yet. God, take me. I'm ready for you. We are the saints that are saved under the fifth period. The period of grace. <laughs> oh, let me tell you something. <laughs> hey, this, this is the easiest period to be saved in. <laughs> oh, you say it's so hard. To no, this is the easiest period to be saved in. You know what you had to do to be saved in Noah's days? Adam and Eve's days. You couldn't fool around with some fruit. You talk about sin now, you couldn't even touch fruit. Now, now I can eat any fruit I want to. Noah's day, you had to make sure you get in the boat. Burn and sacrifice, offer, you had to do all those things. Jesus' day, you had to deny what everybody else believed. You had to become the all about and everything else and put your life in, in jeopardy and danger and everything else. And we know the early church was stoned and killed and all that. I'm not saying, you say, well, that's not easy. Getting saved is easy. Maybe you sacrifice to give your life may be hard. We are the church. Aren't you so glad he called you in this dispensation, this town, to be a part of his church, to be a part of his bride, to be in him? Won't you just lift your hands? Won't you worship him? Aren't you glad that he's given you all the power over all the power of the enemy? He's given us everything we need to be saved in this world. He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Is this heaven? No, it's not heaven. And the minute we stop trying to make it heaven, we will overcome. Come on, that's it right there. Come on, worship him all over the house. Come on, it's just a couple of minutes after eight, worship him all over the house. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, prepare us, Lord. He said he's coming for a church without spot, blameless, wrinkle, or anything. In Jesus' name, prepare us, O oh Lord. Prepare us, God, for your coming, for your kingdom. I give myself away. I belong to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Let me let me say this, and we're going to dismiss. You, you hear me talk a lot about the church in the book of, uh, as it relates to the book of Revelation, and that's one of my themes. I'm, I'm teaching the whole book, but that's my theme because every, through almost every chapter that I've read from, 
We look at things that just, it, it, as far as my view is concerned, that just doesn't add up to the church being here. And to me, that's important. I, it's important because just just say supposition. This is um, you know, or hypothetical, really. Just say uh, that. The church is not going to be here. Why would God want to intimidate us to think that we would be? Or for us to be intimidated that we would be? If we're not, I know it, you know. Now for others who feel like the church is going to be here. They feel like we're giving people false hope. My hope is not in that. The, that's nothing really the devil can do. What's the, the thing that the devil can do to me is what he can do right now. If the devil had power over us, he would kill us now. He, can't, he couldn't do anything to me in the tribulation period that he can't do now if he has power over me. So it's not false hope. Because quite frankly, if I have to go through the tribulation period, I have to go through it. That doesn't, going through the tribulation period is not what saves me. Going through the tribulation period is not what's going to purify me because if I'm not pure now, if I'm not purified now, what about the saints? Oh, see, this is another thing. What about the saints from the, 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 the church from its inception? If the church today have to go through the tribulation to be purified, the rest of the church, through all the rest of the ages, didn't have to go through the tribulation to be purified? Why was it okay and enough for them to be saved throughout all of the church age. But now in the last days, the only way the church is going to be purified is that they got to go through the tribulation period. So that means the tri church throughout the whole uh, time frame since the book of Acts and, and chapter, Acts chapter 2, that the whole church, they didn't have to go through a purification process. They didn't go through the tribulation period. They had stuff going on just like we all have stuff going on. The tribulation is not to make the church ready. Because if I'm, if, if I, what if I die before the tribulation? That means I can't be saved because I didn't go through the tribulation and get ready. It doesn't make sense. At least to me, that stuff like that just doesn't make sense. And I, I think I'm a, a logical, rational man. I think. I had to talk to my wife on the side. As a matter of fact, he said, when these things begin yes. to happen, not when they happen, yes. when they begin to happen, look up because your redemption draweth not. Yes. He didn't say after all these things happen, when, when you go through all this, then your redemption is going to come. No, he said, when these things begin to happen, it's going to, you look up. And we're seeing stuff beginning to happen. And that's why I believe we're going to see stuff happen beginning to happen. No, I suppose to look for the rapture. I suppose to look for, that's not a false hope. Lift your hands up one more time. Anybody looking for him? I know we believe in revival and harvest and we're going to see all that. But the greatest way to have all that is to look for Jesus. Not to look for the Antichrist, look for tribulation, look for destruction, look for signs in the earth, look for wonders. I'm looking for Jesus and his kingdom. That's all I'm looking. I'm seeking the kingdom first. I'm not seeking all that stuff. God never asked us to seek all those signs and wonders and what's happening in the earth and all that. He didn't ask us to seek that. He asked us to seek him, his face, and his kingdom. 
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. You dismiss in Jesus' name.